I've been an ice fisherman pretty much my whole life. From the time that I was old enough to hold a rod, I've been out on the frozen lake every winter, drilling holes in the ice and dropping lines into the frigid water below. There's just something about that stillness, the solitude, that I've always found comforting. The world slows down out there. The only sounds is the creaking ice beneath you and the occasional gust of wind rattling through the trees on the shore. For me, it's a ritual, a way to reset and find some peace after the chaos of the year. Every winter, as soon as the ice was thick enough, my cousin Teddy and I would pack up our gear and head out to the lake. We'd set up our ice fishing house, a small makeshift shelter with just enough room for the two of us and our rods, and of course a little heater to keep the cold at bay. Spent hours, sometimes even days, just waiting for a fish to bite. It was our escape, our sanctuary. Most of the locals in the area did the same, clustering together inside the little makeshift villages out on the ice. Their shelters huddled up close enough to one another for warmth and some company. There's always a good sense of camaraderie out there among the fishermen, and a shared understanding that we were all out there for the same reason. It wasn't just about the fish, it was about the whole experience, the stories that we'd tell when we got back to shore. One winter though, Teddy and I decided to do things a little differently. We were kind of tired of the noise, the chatter, the clinking of beer bottles as the other fishermen huddled up together and shot the breeze. We wanted to get away from it all, find a spot on the lake where we could truly be alone. So we drove Teddy's truck out across the ice, past the cluster of fishing houses, past the well-trodden paths, until we reached a part of the lake that nobody else seemed to be using. It was a long drive, maybe a mile or so, winding through a thick stand of trees that just jutted out into the lake. The ice was thick here, over four feet in some places, solid enough to support the weight of a truck. We found a spot that was perfect, secluded, quiet, with the view of the frozen wilderness stretching out in every direction. It was exactly what we were looking for. We set up our house, drilled our holes, and settled in for a long day of fishing. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting a pale light over the snow-covered landscape. There wasn't anybody else out there, not a soul in sight. It felt like we had the whole world to ourselves. For a while, it was perfect. The fish were biting, the sky was clear. The only sound was the occasional crack and groan of the ice beneath us. We stayed out there all day, catching more fish than we knew what to do with. By the time the sun started to dip below the horizon, we were both grinning like kids on Christmas morning. We left the ice house where it was, planning to come back the next day, even the day after that. It's pretty standard practice around here. Once you find a good spot, you really didn't want to give it up easily. We packed up our gear, loaded into the truck, and drove back to town, already looking forward to our next trip back out there. For the next couple of weeks, that little ice house became our home away from home. Every weekend, we'd be driving out there, just the two of us, spending hours fishing, talking, or even just sitting in silence, enjoying the peace and quiet. It was literally everything we'd ever hoped for when we decided to find a spot away from those other fishermen. But then the storm hit. It was a big one. The kind that sends people running for cover. The snow came down in thick, heavy flakes, piling up on the roads and rooftops, and then the ice. For nine or ten days, the lake was completely inaccessible, buried under a blanket of deep snow. Nobody dared venture out there, not even the most diehard fishermen. When the storm finally passed, the town slowly started to come back to life. People dug themselves out, cleared the roads, got back to their routines. Teddy and I were itching to get back out on the lake, but we knew we had to wait until it was safe. The snow was very deep, the drifts high, and the ice, though still thick, had become very treacherous in places. We couldn't resist the pull, though. One morning, after hearing the roads had been cleared enough to drive on, we decided to take the 4x4 out and see if we could make it to our ice house. We loaded the truck up with our gear and headed out braving the snow drifts and the icy winds. To our complete surprise, we really didn't encounter any trouble. 
The drive was slow and snow deep in places, but Petty's truck handled it like a champ. We made our way around the bend of trees and finally reached our spot on the far side of the lake. Our ice house, still sitting there, standing sturdy against the wind and snow. But as we approached it, something felt off. The snow around the house was disturbed, trampled down by boot prints and marked tracks of a sled or something similar. There were signs that somebody had been there, recently too, by the looks of it. Hey, you think somebody else found our spot? Teddy asked, his breath puffing out in clouds of steam as he spoke. Doesn't look like it, I replied, squinting at the tracks. These are definitely fresh, but there's no other fishing houses around. They did. It didn't look like they stayed long. Got out of the truck and approached the house cautiously. There was trash scattered all around. Empty wrappers, bits of food, and what looked like remains of a small campfire nearby. Strange. Most people who came out here were pretty respectful. Careful not to leave any trace of their presence. Whoever had been here definitely didn't seem to care about that at all. You think maybe it was game and fish? Teddy suggested. Maybe they were just making sure everybody got off the lake before the storm. Could be, I said. But the trash did not fit that theory. Game wardens would not have left a mess like this. No, this was somebody else. Maybe somebody got caught in the storm and just used the house as shelter. Guess we'll never know, Teddy said with a shrug. Let's get set up. I want to get a few hours in before the sun goes down. We spent the next hour or so getting the ice house back in order. Cleared away all the trash, redrilled the holes in the ice, and set up our rods. By the time that we were done, the sun was high in the sky, casting long shadows across a snow-covered lake. But as we settled in for what we hoped would be a productive day of fishing, things started to get strange. It started out with the water. As I was checking one of the lines, I noticed something floating just beneath the ice. At first, I thought it was just debris, maybe some leaves or bits of plant matter that had gotten trapped underneath the ice. But as I looked closer, I realized it was something else entirely. Hey, Teddy, I called out waving him over. Come take a look at this. Teddy came over and peered into the hole. What is that? <laughs> I'm not sure, I said frowning. Looks like wrappers? And is that meat? Teddy leaned closer, squinting at the murky shapes beneath the ice. Alright, who the hell would throw trash down a fishing hole? We both stared at that strange debris floating beneath the ice, trying to make sense of it. There were bits of paper, plastic wrappers, and what looked like chunks of meat, raw, bloody, and floating just beneath the surface. Maybe whoever was here before used the holes as a trash can too, Teddy suggested, but his voice was uncertain. I don't know why they would be throwing meat down there though. I didn't have an answer for him, but the whole thing was just starting to give me the creeps. As the day wore on, we found more strange things in the water. Bits of clothing, more wrappers, what even looked like a piece of bone. It was pretty obvious somebody had been using our fishing spot as a dumping ground, or something, but I wasn't sure what, and the thought made my skin crawl. Hey, maybe we should just call it a day, what do you think? Teddy said finally, glancing at the darkening sky. It looks like there might be another storm coming in. I looked up and saw the heavy clouds gathering on the horizon. The last thing that I wanted was to get caught out here in another blizzard. Yeah, you're probably right. Let's just pack up. We hurried through our gear, a sense of unease growing and growing with every passing minute. We loaded the last of our stuff into the truck. I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I turned and looked back towards the ice house. There, standing against the snow drifts, was a man. He was tall and thin, his clothes dark and ragged. He stood motionless, watching us with an intensity that made my blood run cold. His face was obscured by the shadows, but I could feel his eyes directly on me, 
boring into me like a predator sizing up its prey. Teddy, I whispered, not taking my eyes off the man. You see this? Teddy turned and followed my gaze. His face immediately went pale. Let's get out of here. We jumped into the truck and sped off, tires slipping and sliding on the ice as we made our way back to town. I glanced in the rearview mirror, saw the man still standing there, his figure growing smaller and smaller as we drove away from him. Neither of us spoke the rest of the drive back. Tension inside the cab was thick, the air heavy with unspoken fear. We didn't stop until we were safely back in a town. The familiar lights of the buildings, a welcome sight after that eerie isolation of the lake. We need to go back with the sheriff, I said finally, breaking the silence. There's just something not right out there, man. Teddy nodded, but neither of us made a move to call the police. We just sat there, staring out the windshield, the memory of that man in the ice burning in our minds. The storm never came. The next morning, the sky was clear and air crisp and cold. But the unease from the day previous lingered, gnawing at the edges of my thoughts. I called Teddy and told him I was going to go back out to the lake, but this time we weren't going alone. We rounded up our friend Sam, a big burly guy who really wasn't afraid of anything. We all made sure that we were armed before heading out. The drive to the lake was tense. None of us really spoke much, our minds clearly on what we might find when we got out there. We neared the bend of the trees that led to our fishing spot. I slowed the truck down and turned the headlights off. We crept forward, the engine barely even making more than a whisper in the still morning air. As we approached the ice house, I saw it, a faint glow coming from inside, like the light of a dying fire or a flashlight with weak batteries. My heart pounded in my chest as I pulled the truck to a stop a good distance away killed the engine and just sat there in silence, watching the glow flicker in the dark. What do we do? Sam asked, his voice low and steady. Check it out, I said, trying to sound a lot braver than I felt. Let's keep it quiet and just stay close together. We climbed out of the truck and our boots crunching together in the snow. The air was so cold it burned my lungs with every breath. We silently moved towards the ice house, our footsteps muffled by the thick blanket of snow. As we got closer, I could see it more clearly now. There was indeed a small fire burning on the outside of the ice house, the last embers glowing faintly in the darkness. The door to the shelter was slightly ajar, and inside, I could see the faint beam of a flashlight moving around. We crept up to the ice house my heart hammering in my chest. I could hear the man inside muttering to himself, his voice low and frantic, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. When we reached the door, I hesitated for a moment, my hand just hovering over the handle. Then, summoning up all my courage, pushed it open. The man inside sprang to his feet, his eyes wild and bloodshot. He was gone, skin pale and stretched tight over his bones. He looked like he hadn't eaten or slept in days. His clothes were filthy, hands streaked with blood. Get out of here! He screamed, his voice cracking with desperation. This is my spot! You can't have it! I'm not here to take anything, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Just want to talk. Go away! He shouted again his eyes darting around the room. You don't understand. You don't know what's out there. Listen, I said, stepping forward. You need to leave. This is private property. And if you don't go, we're going to have to call the police. The man's eyes locked onto mine. And for a moment, I saw something in them that made my blood run cold. It wasn't fear or anger or desperation. Something else something darker. He started to mutter again, strange words that I couldn't discern. And then, before I could even react, he lunged at me. 
I fell back, my head smacking against the icy floor as he tackled me to the ground. Pain exploded in my skull, and for a moment, everything went white. I heard the others shouting, the sound of scuffling, and then a loud crack as something smashed against the side of my head. I blinked, trying to clear my haze from my vision. I saw the man standing over me, a broken beer bottle in his hand. Blood dripped from my temple, warm and sticky against the cold air. He raised the bottle again, but before he could bring it down, there was a deafening bang. Sam had fired his gun, the shot echoing through the ice house like a cannon blast. The man flinched, bottle dropping from his hand. In the confusion, he turned and bolted out the door, disappearing into the darkness. For a moment, nobody moved. The ice house went eerily quiet, the only sounds of heavy breathing from the three of us, as we were all processing what had just happened. Hey, you okay? Teddy asked, kneeling beside me. Yeah, yeah, I muttered, touching the side of my head. My fingers came away slick with blood, but it didn't feel too serious. Where, where'd he go? Into the trees, Sam said, his voice shaky. He just, just ran. We all stood there staring at the door, half expecting the man to come charging back in. But the night remained still. The only sound was the distant howl of the wind. After a few moments, we gathered ourselves, decided to investigate the ice house. What we found inside was worse than anybody could have imagined. The floor was covered in blood, smeared across the ice in these strange patterns that almost looked like runes or some kind of symbol. In the corner, there were piles of dead rodents and small animals, their bodies chopped up and arranged in this grotesque display. The stench of death hung heavy in the air mixing with the smell of burnt wood and something else, something sour and rotting. What in the hell? Teddy whispered. I moved closer to the fishing holes, my stomach churning as I looked down into the dark water. There were pieces of flesh floating just below the surface, and beneath them, I could see shadowy shapes of fish, their pale bodies writhing as they fed on those grotesque scraps. All right, we need to call the cops, Sam said, his voice firm. Now. Yeah, I agreed, tearing my eyes away from the water. What if that guy comes back? We'll split up, Teddy suggested. You take the truck and drive up the hill. Flash the lights towards town. Sam and I will follow his tracks and see if we can find out where he went wasn't a perfect plan, but it was the best we had in the moment. I climbed into the truck and drove back to the nearby hill, positioning the vehicle so headlights would face the distant lights of town. I started flashing my headlights in an SOS pattern, hoping somebody, anybody, would see him. Meanwhile, Teddy and Sam disappeared into the trees, their flashlights cutting through the darkness as they followed that man's tracks. I just sat there, truck idling, heart pounding in my chest as I kept flashing those lights, on and off. Minutes continued to pass, it felt like hours. My fingers were numb from the cold, my breath fogging up the windshield as I just stared out into the night, anxiously waiting for something to happen. Finally, I saw them, two figures emerging from the trees, shoulders slumped into feet. Teddy and Sam had returned, but they were empty-handed. Nothing, Sam said as he climbed back into the truck, his voice hollow. His tracks just stopped, almost like he vanished into thin air. Maybe he climbed a tree, I suggested weakly, though I didn't really believe what I was saying. Or grew a pair of wings, Teddy muttered rubbing his hand together to warm them up. We just sat there in the silence, the weight of the night pressing down on us like a lead blanket. The ice house, the man, the symbols in the snow, it all felt like some kind of twisted nightmare, something that we might wake up from any minute now. 
but it was not a dream. The blood on my head, the smell of death in the air, it was all real. It wasn't going away. Eventually, we saw some headlights in the distance, growing closer as a vehicle made its way across the ice. It was a game warden, his truck plowing through the snow as he approached us. Relief washed over me as he pulled up next to us, the beam of his flashlight sweeping over our faces. What's going on out here? The warden asked, his voice gruff and businesslike. I told him everything about the man, the symbols, the animals, the blood. He listened in silence, his expression growing more serious with every word spoken. I'll, uh, I'll radio for backup, he said finally, his tone grim. Boys, just stay put. More law enforcement arrived not long after. The flashing lights of their vehicles, casting this eerie shadow across the frozen lake. They questioned us and took our statements, then supervised as we broke down the ice house, loading up our gear into the back of the truck. The whole time, I kept glancing back towards the trees, half expecting to see that man standing there again, watching us. But he never reappeared. In the end, they never found him. Nobody was arrested, at least from my understanding. And the case, if you would even call it that, was just quietly closed. For obvious reasons, Teddy and I never went back to that part of the lake again. We stuck to the crowded areas, where the noise and chatter of the other fishermen was a welcome distraction for the memories of that night. Sometimes late at night when I'm lying in bed, I think about that man, about his wild eyes and frantic muttering, the way he just disappeared into the darkness without a trace. I wonder what he was doing out there, what drove him to be that isolated on that spot on the lake? Was he just some lost soul, driven mad by the cold and solitude? Was there something more sinister at play? I've tried to put it out of my mind to convince myself that it was just a random encounter with a desperate man. There's something about it that I just can't shake. Something that gnaws at the edges of my thoughts when I'm all alone. It's not just the man himself. It was those symbols, the blood, the strange ritualistic way everything was arranged inside my ice house. It really was like something out of a nightmare. Something that didn't belong out in the real world. The fact that it happened out there, in the place where I used to find peace and solitude, makes it even worse. It's like the ice, the lake, that whole landscape has just been tainted by that one night, corrupted by whatever dark force was at work. Teddy no longer even wants to talk about it. Whenever I bring it up, he just shakes his head and changes the subject immediately. I guess I can't really blame him. We both have our own separate ways of dealing with what happened. And for him, that means pretending like it never did. But I can't do that. I need answers. I need to know what we stumbled upon that night and why it's left such a deep scar in my mind. I've done a little research since then, coming through old newspapers and online forums, looking for any mention of similar incidents. There's not really much to go on, just a few scattered reports of strange disappearances, unexplained phenomena in remote areas, but nothing that matches like what we experienced. It's like that man on the ice was a ghost, a figment of our imagination. But I know he's real. I can still see his face, those wide haunted eyes, the way he moved with a desperation that bordered on madness. I could still feel the cold, the bone chilling cold that seeped into my skin. A cold that seems to carry with it something way more sinister, something dark, something evil. There are nights when I lie awake staring at the ceiling and I think about going back out there. I think about retracing our steps and finding that exact spot on the lake, seeing if there's anything left, any clues, any more signs of what took place that night. But every time I start to make my own plans, something stops me. It's almost like a voice in the back of my mind, telling me that some things are just better left alone. There are forces in this world that we're not meant to understand. 
Maybe that's true. Maybe it's best I do let it go. Try and move on with my life. And forget all about that night. But I can't. I keep thinking about him. I think about those symbols. About the strange things that we found underneath the ice. There's got to be more to the story. There's got to be something that we missed. Something that could explain it all. Or maybe it is all in my head. And there really is nothing to explain. Maybe it was just a random encounter with a madman. A freak occurrence that had no deeper meaning. Deep down, I know that's not true, though. There was something else out there that night. Something that we stumbled upon by accident. And whatever or whoever it was, it's still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to wander too far off the beaten path. Occasionally, I'll dream about that man. The way he looked at me before he just disappeared into the trees. In my dreams, I follow him, chasing him through the snow, deeper and deeper into the forest. The trees will close in around me, the air growing colder and colder until I could barely even breathe. I can hear his footsteps ahead of me, the crunch of the snow beneath his boots. But I can never catch up to him. He's always just out of reach. Just continues to lead me deeper into the darkness. And that's when I wake up, drenched in sweat, heart still pounding in my chest. The room will be warm, blankets wrapped tightly around me. But I can still feel that cold, that bone chilling cold that clings to me like a second skin. I don't know what it all means, and maybe I never will. But one thing's for sure, I'll never look at ice fishing the same way again. I've always found a strange comfort in isolation, the kind that you can only really get when you're miles and miles away from civilization, with nothing but water beneath you and the sky above you. That's why, every year without bail, I'll load up my Subaru with all my gear and head out to the backcountry of Colorado. There's this reservoir out there hidden in a canyon, with cliffs rising on either side, and water so deep and clear, you can see straight down to the bottom where the ancient trees lie like ghosts. Most folks stuck out to the front half of the reservoir, where the water was wide and the cliffs offered some prime spots for cliff diving. It was almost like a tourist trap, with paddle boarders and kayakers dotting the water like ants at a picnic. But me, I'd like to push out further. I'd navigate to the reservoir's twists and turns, till I reached the far end, where the water would funnel into a series of streams that carved their way through the wilderness. The back of the reservoir was just a different world. The waterway narrowed, hemmed in by trees that loomed like sentinels, the roots twisting down into the earth. The only sounds were the quiet lap of the water against the kayak, the occasional call of a bird. Beyond the dam that marked the end of the reservoir, the water turns treacherous. It's clogged with logs and debris from past logging operations. It's like paddling through a graveyard of trees, their skeletal remains bobbing up on the surface. Most people avoided it. It's too much trouble for far little to reward. But for me, it was a gateway to real solitude. My morning was just like any other. The sun was barely over the horizon as I strapped the kayak to the roof, packed up my gear and hit the road. The drive itself was uneventful the only company being the occasional truck or maybe even SUV, likely headed to the same reservoir. By the time I reached the shore, the place was already buzzing with activity. Kids were splashing in the shallows. Groups of kayakers were preparing to set off, their laughter echoing off the cliffs. I pushed off, my kayak gliding effortlessly across the water. The first part of the trip was always the most tedious, dodging other boarders, Navigating around the paddle boarders who seemed to have no sense of direction whatsoever, avoiding the swimmers who ventured out too far from shore. It wasn't until I rounded that first corner that I started to feel the tension in my shoulders ease. 
The crowds finally thinned. The noise started to recede, replaced by the gentle sound of water lapping against the cliffs. By the time I reached that last bend before the dam, I was completely alone. The sky above me was a brilliant blue. The water beneath me was so clear that I could see those submerged trees, their branches reaching up like hands of the drowned. This was my favorite part, the calm before the chaos of the debris field. As I approached the dam, I noticed something odd. There's a man standing off the shore, fishing pole in hand. There were no trails that led to this part of the reservoir, which meant he'd either been camping here for a while or he made the long trek from the parking lot on foot. Either way, it was super unusual to see anybody else out here. I gave him a nod as I passed, and he returned the gesture. Something dark hid in his eyes that made me pause, though. Careful up ahead, he called out as I paddled past him. His voice was rough like he hadn't spoken to anybody in days. Why's that? I called out, slowing my pace. He hesitated, glancing up over his shoulder as if he expected somebody to appear from the trees. I've been hearing gunshots from the other side of the dam, he said. Gone on for a couple of days now. Gunshots? I echoed, even more confused than concerned. Yeah, I don't know who's back there or what they're shooting at. It's been going on for quite a while. I thanked him for the warning, but I really wasn't too worried. There's plenty of hunters in these parts. It wasn't uncommon to hear gunfire in the distance. Still, as I paddled away from him, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story, more than he was letting on to. The dam loomed ahead of me, a hulking mass of concrete that divided the reservoir from the chaos beyond. Water funneled through the narrow gap, where years and years of logs, branches, and other debris had now collected. Navigating it was pretty tricky, especially with the current tugging at the kayak. But I'd done it so many times now, I knew exactly how to get through. The trick was to keep your momentum, to not get caught up on any of the logs and just stay focused. That debris field was as treacherous as I remembered from the last time. Logs bobbed on the surface, some barely visible beneath the water. And more than once, I had to backtrack a little bit to avoid getting stuck. At one point, the kayak scraped against the submerged branch. I winced as I felt the bottom of the boat grind against the wood. But I pushed through. And soon enough, I was right on the other side. The water over here was different darker, colder. I had an eerie stillness that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. The stream that I followed wound its way through the dense forest, the trees closing in overhead like a tunnel. It was beautiful in a way, the kind of wild, untamed beauty that makes you feel like you were the absolutely first person to ever set foot here. But it was also unsettling. The silence was just too complete and the shadows too deep. As I paddled on, I started to notice something else strange. The stream, usually clear and clean, was littered with debris, plastic bottles, torn pieces of cloth, and something that looked disturbingly like a shoe. It definitely wasn't uncommon to find trash in the water, but this was different. It was fresh, recent. Somebody had been through here just before me. Then I saw two paddle boards, abandoned and floating aimlessly in a narrow part of the stream. One of them had bullet holes in it, the edges splintered and raw. There were bags strapped to the boards, their contents half spilled into the water. Snacks, water bottles, a pair of sunglasses. Whoever had been here had definitely left in a hurry. A chill ran down my spine as I remembered that fisherman's warning. Had these people been shot at? Something worse even happened. I hesitated, my paddle hovering above the water. Every single instinct inside me screamed at me to turn back, head back to safety of the reservoir, and forget that I even saw any of this. But curiosity got the better of me. I had to know what was going on. I pushed on 
kayak gliding silently through the water. The stream twisted and turned, trees pressing in closer and closer, their branches reaching out to me like hands. The further I went, the more feeling of being watched grew, an itch between my shoulder blades that wouldn't go away. And that's when I heard voices, low and indistinct, coming from somewhere ahead. I froze, straining to hear, but the words were muffled, lost in the rustle of leaves and gurgle of the water. There was no mistaking it. Somebody else was out here. I kept paddling, my heart pounding in my chest. Voices grew louder, more distinct. Then I saw him, a man, older, with a scraggly beard and a flannel shirt, moving through the trees parallel to the stream. He was trying to keep out of sight, but the terrain was too rough, undergrowth too thick. He didn't see me at first. He was too focused on wherever he was going, but when he did, his eyes locked onto mine. My blood immediately ran cold. He was holding a shotgun in his hand, the barrel gleaming in that dappled sunlight. I did not wait to see what he would do. I dug my paddle into the water and propelled the kayak forward as fast as I could. The man shouted something, but I didn't stop to listen. I rounded a bend in the stream, my breath coming in ragged gasps, the kayak bumping into rocks and branches as I continued on. For a moment, I thought I lost him. The stream opened up into a wider section. And I could see an outline of the lake ahead, its surface like glass reflecting the sky. But that's when I saw them, two more men, standing on a fallen log that spanned the stream, blocking my path. One of them had a revolver and the other a rifle, both aimed directly at me. Stop right there! The one with the revolver barked. His voice echoed off the trees. Didn't have a choice, I slowed my kayak, letting it drift until it came to a stop beneath the log. The men just stared down at me, their faces hard and eyes cold. What are you doing out here? The man with the rifle asked, his tone more curious than accusatory. Uh, just kayaking, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Exploring the area, I've been coming out here for years. The man with the revolver exchanged a glance with his companion. Something passed between the two that I couldn't really decipher. Shouldn't be out here, he said finally. This is private property. I didn't know, I lied, hoping to placate them. I thought this was all public land. It's not. The rifleman said. Turn around and go back the way you came. I nodded, gripping my paddle tighter. All right, all right, will do, I said, forcing a smile. I'll head back right now. Make sure you tell anybody else out there you see to stay out of this area, the man with the revolver added, his voice as hard as a steel in his hand. We don't want any more visitors out here. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to do that, I promised, even though I knew I wouldn't see anybody else on my way back. No one else was crazy enough to venture this deep into the wilderness, and definitely not now after what I'd seen. They never lowered their guns, not even as I started to paddle back the way I came. I could feel their eyes still on me, burning into my back as I put as much distance as possible between us. My heart was pounding in my ears as I fought that urge to look back over my shoulders, afraid I might see them following me. I didn't feel safe until the stream curved up ahead, taking me out of their sight. I slowed down, allowing myself finally a moment to catch my breath. I noticed my hands were shaking. I had to grip that paddle tight to keep it from slipping out of my grasp. What the hell was that? Who are those men? What are they doing out there? The words private property just echoed in my mind, but I knew that was bullshit. This was public land. It's a national forest. Nobody had any right to claim it for themselves. Except maybe they did. There were plenty of stories that I've heard about people setting up illegal operations in remote areas. 
moonshine stills, meth labs, more recently, marijuana grow sites. Colorado had legalized weed, but that didn't stop people from trying to grow and sell it underneath the radar, especially out here where nobody was likely to stumble across them, or at least nobody who lived to tell the tale. I shivered despite the warmth of the sun. I got lucky, too lucky. Those men had been in a worse mood, or maybe I said the wrong thing. I might not have made it out of there, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my luck was quickly running out. I reached the spot where the stream forked and one branch leading back to the reservoir and the other continuing deeper into the wilderness. I didn't waste any time hauling my kayak out of the water and dragging it through the underbrush to the other stream. Smaller and shallower, it would be harder to navigate, but it would also be less likely to be patrolled by those armed men. The forest around me was eerily silent as I worked. The only sounds of rustling leaves and the occasional bird call. I kept expecting to hear footsteps behind me, crack of a gunshot. Nothing came. Still, the fear gnawed at me, making every shadow almost seem like a threat, every branch a potential hiding spot for another armed stranger. Finally, I reached that second stream and slid my kayak back into the water. I paused for a brief moment listening. The only sound I heard was the soft gurgle of the stream as it flowed over those rocks. I took a deep breath and pushed off, paddling upstream with all the strength that I could muster. The current fought against me, but I was determined to put as much distance as possible between me and whatever the hell was going on back there. The going was slow, shallow water forcing me to navigate carefully around those rocks and fallen trees. My arms ached. My heart raced every time the kayak scraped against something. I kept moving, though. I had to get back to the reservoir. Back to safety. As I rounded a bend in the stream, I spotted something that made my blood run cold. The man with the shotgun earlier. He was pacing along the bank of the larger stream, his back to me, muttering something under his breath that I couldn't quite make out. His gun hung loosely at his side, but the way he moved, restless and agitated, it told me he was looking for something or maybe someone. I froze, barely even daring to breathe. The current tugged at my kayak, threatening to pull me downstream, but I held my position, praying that he wouldn't turn around. After what felt like an eternity, he stopped, let out this frustrated growl and then stormed off into the woods. I waited until I was absolutely sure he was gone before I started paddling again, this time a lot more carefully, making sure to stay as silent as possible. The rest of that journey was a blur of fear and exhaustion. I kept expecting to see more of those men, to hear the crack of a gunshot, the rustle of movement in the trees around me, but nothing came. The closer I got back to the reservoir, the more the tension in my chest eased. But it wasn't until I saw that familiar log debris field that I finally allowed myself to breathe normally again. Navigating that debris on the way back was even harder than before. My arms were trembling with fatigue. My nerves were just shot. More than once, I got stuck on a submerged branch, the kayak tilting dangerously as I fought to free myself. All the while, I kept glancing over my shoulder half expecting to see one of those men just appearing from the trees, gun raised at me. There was nobody, only the still silent wilderness. When I finally emerged from that log field and into the main part of the reservoir, it was like crossing back into the real world. The water was calm and wide, sky bright and open, and in the distance, I could see the figures of other kayakers and paddleboarders oblivious to the nightmare that just lay beyond that dam. I paddled as fast as I could, desperate to put this entire ordeal behind me. My muscles screamed in protest, but I didn't care. I just needed to get back to shore, to the safety of my car and away from whatever the hell I stumbled into. As I neared that spot where I saw that fisherman earlier, I saw him once more, still standing on the shore, his line cast lazily into the water. 
He looked up as I approached, a smile of recognition on his face, but as I drew closer, that same smile faded. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, his brow furrowing in concern. I pulled up along the shore, letting my kayak just drift. Yeah, you could, uh, you could say that, I replied, my voice shaky. What happened? I hesitated, glancing back over my shoulder. I think you were right about those gunshots, I said quietly. There are men back there, armed. They told me to turn back. The fisherman's face paled. He quickly reeled in his line. Jesus, he muttered, looking toward the dam. I knew something was off, but did you see anybody else? No, I said, shaking my head. But you said you saw another kayaker. Yeah, not too long after you passed by, he said, his voice tense. Young guy, heading the same way as you. My stomach dropped. The other kayak, the gunshots. Did he come back? I asked. Though I think I already knew the answer. The fisherman's face told me everything I needed to know. He shook his head slowly and his expression was grim. I, I didn't see him again. We shared a look of understanding, the weight of what happened settling over us like this shroud. We need to call the police, I said, my voice barely even above a whisper. The fisherman nodded, already pulling out his phone. Yeah, yeah. We do. I didn't even wait around to see what happened next though. I thanked the fisherman and paddled my last stretch back to shore, mind racing. By the time I reached the parking lot, I was on autopilot, hauling my kayak onto the roof and strapping it back down, throwing my gear into the back of the Subaru. I didn't stop moving until I was behind the wheel, engine running and parking lot shrinking in my rear view mirror. It wasn't until I hit the main road again that I even allowed myself to fully breathe. The tension drained out of me, leaving only behind exhaustion and that lingering sense of unease. Pulled over as soon as I had signal and dialed 911 myself, my hands shaking as I relayed what happened to the dispatcher. The police took my report seriously. Later I heard through the grapevine that they did indeed investigate the area. Rumor has it some local rednecks had set up this illegal grow operation deep in that forest and had been scaring anybody who got close off. They were eventually arrested, but the memory of that day still haunts me. Not been back to that reservoir since. Now I stick to the main waterways, where the only things I have to worry about are the crowds and the occasional rude paddle border. But every now and again, when I'm out on the water, I find myself glancing back towards the reservoir, wondering what might be still lurking in those deep dark woods, just out of sight. The year was 1989 on the eastern end of Long Island. It was mid-July on a nice hot summer day, a perfect one to get out on the water. My dad had a 17-foot Mako fishing boat that we all affectionately called the Mighty Mako. It had a 90 horsepower outboard engine called the Tower of Power. We have a lot of nicknames for things, I guess. But anyway, she was an all inline six with a center console that had a small bench seat in the front, just big enough to hold a cooler and keep out of the sun. There was a small hold in the V-berth that we stored all of our life preservers in, along with the anchor and a rickety metal hand railing around the bow that probably could have used a few more screws to tighten it up, but it was still attached. We all used to love to sit up there, hold on to it at cruising speeds, screaming with laughter when our toes touched the water below. Lots and lots of memories were made on this boat, 
and lots of stories. And some of them, I won't soon forget. And this is one of those stories. There are a few more, many more actually. But this one is the harrowing story of Plum Gut. So, good old Wild Bill, who is my father, took my older sister Melissa and I out one day with his youngest brother, Uncle Johnny. I was seven years old at the time, and my sister was about to turn 10. It was just going to be for a day trip, some fishing and some fun. Maybe we might even get to go swimming at Split Rock, if the tide was right. Then maybe we'd head further out to Cedar Point Lighthouse for some bottom fishing near the breakwater. Fried fluke makes for a delicious meal, so we're all in pretty good spirits and had high hopes for the day. It was going to be a good one. A few hours of fishing in the hot sun had gone by. The wind and tide started to change, making the conditions just about right for reeling in some big stripers out of the gut. My sister and I were, by now, getting bored. And we're eager to feel some of the wind on our faces and maybe cool off a bit as we cruised, so off we went. We headed further out to Long Island Sound, towards the ocean, towards Plum Island. I'm sure some of you might have heard the stories of Animal Research Island, owned by the government and it's off limits to the public, but that's for another story for another time. In South Holt, the northern folk of Long Island, there the land between two islands comes together and squeezes all the ocean water into the bay. An oncoming tide and forms this rip of sea where the bottom goes from 300 foot deep to 30 feet in a relatively small space creating some pretty big swells on top of the water. Mostly only bigger fishing vessels dared to even fish here. The rip at Plum Gate made for some good feeding grounds for the bigger ocean striped bass at certain times. Times like the changing of the tide on a hot mid-July day, like this day, and then just about at this time too. And if we were lucky, we could make it out there with just enough to reel in a few big ones before dark and still make it back to shore safely. At least, that was the intention. The sea was calm on the way out. Not glassy, but smooth with rolling waves, seemingly getting bigger and bigger as the wind would pick up. We were all just enjoying the ride. The sun was high and it was hot out. The spray from the bow of the boat cutting through the waves felt nice and refreshing. It was cooling off our sunburnt skin. We were laughing together, trying to hold on tight for the ride. But this is the ocean, and the weather can be known to change at the drop of a dime, especially out at the gut. It's very unpredictable. It could be a bright and sunny day out one minute and the next go dark gray and stormy. And that's exactly what happened. Sun-filled skies quickly turned ominously gray. Suddenly it got dark and the wind picked up. The water quickly turned white-capped. The waves got bigger and bigger. Our little boat was rocking in those waves as they grew, and the wind was now whipping us. We were scared, my sister and I. We were definitely ready to go home. A storm was on the horizon and seemed to be heading straight for us. It was going to hit and hit hard, and my dad knew it. After looking around at the quickly changing sky, he looked at his brother and then down at us girls. Finally decided it was time to reel it up and head back. By now, though, the rain was sideways and pelting at our faces. The wind had picked up. The sky went black until a bolt of lightning lit it up like a New Year's celebration, making the sky look fiery and angry. We saw a few lightning strikes make contact with the water, which by this point very much resembled the water in a washing machine. We were all terrified. We hadn't even really known the meaning of the word scared until now. Mel and I are crouched down behind the center console with our never worn before life preservers on, in between and holding onto my dad and uncle's legs, who were both holding onto the dashboard for dear life as our little boat steamed on, crashing through wave after wave, one immediately after the other, crashed into us, head on. We thought for sure the boat would surely sink and we were going to drown out there. I felt like this went on for an eternity. We were now freezing, wet and shivering, holding on so tightly and completely filled with fear of potentially getting washed overboard with the next big wave that would hit. 
That's exactly what happened to me. It was cold, dark, and loud. So loud that the boat sounded like it was cracking up. It sounded like breaking, sinking. There was water everywhere, all around me. I was constantly holding my breath, then gasping for air, when there was a two-second lull between waves crashing into us. There wasn't a wall of water surrounding me, threatening to drown me right there in that little boat. Then all of a sudden, I found myself weightless. Everything went quiet around me. I was turned over and around, and then felt like I was now upside down, inside the cold, white water. I reached my little arms out for my dad, but I'd lost grip of his legs. I couldn't feel him anymore. I couldn't feel the warmth of him. Now I was even more scared. Then in the cold, quiet darkness, I felt my hand brush against metal amidst the icy water. It was the hand railing on the bow. It was below me. I gripped onto it somehow with my left hand. My feet were extended up above my head in the water, almost vertically. If I lost my grip of that rickety metal railing, I was surely a goner. I'd be washed away in a second. No longer to be on that boat, I'd be lost at sea, way out in the treacherous waters, and the rip of plum gut. The next thing I knew, the water opened up around me, just enough for me to be able to take in a deep breath of air and open up my eyes. It was still dark, but there in front of my face, lit up by lightning, was a hand. It was my dad's huge hand, fingers spread wide and ready to grab with all their might. And beyond that outstretched arm and hand was my father's face, wide-eyed and panic-stricken, staring right back at me with a look of pure devastation. He'd left Johnny on the helm, Melissa still tucked down underneath him, between his legs, now fully blocked behind the console, holding on and crying. He stood firmly braced against the bench seat, with one arm outstretched and reaching for me, all while still holding onto the dashboard of the center console, as to hopefully not get washed overboard with me. And just as my tiny, wet, and tired fingers were about to lose grip of that old railing, that rickety, old, and loose, but fabulous, life-saving safety keeper of a railing, God bless it, he finally got a hold of some part of me, and then as my life, short as it was back then, was flashing before my eyes, he yanked me right out of the water and didn't let go until I was thoroughly tucked back underneath his knees, holding on to him and that tiny center console and that relatively tiny boat in comparison to the surrounding seas, then yelled at us to hold on and stay down. And that's exactly what I did. It might have been my first time in my life that I actually listened and did exactly what I was told to do. I held on and stayed down as best I could. I was crying, and I prayed too, for what seemed like a very long time. Thankfully, we made it back that day, safely but shaken up. And to this day, we still tell that story sometimes, usually around Thanksgiving. <laughs>